with your permission, I'm going to start by talking about something that has nothing to do with our subject tonight, because I was reminded of it when I walked in tonight. I've just come in um, late for the best reason a newspaper guy can have. I ran into a story today. I had to report it, I had to write it, and I just got through doing it, and I ran over here from, or I took the Crosstown bus from the UN. And I was reminded of something when I came in the door by somebody I saw. When I was editor of the New York Times Magazine, a decade ago or so, um, I, it was about the time of the Democratic National Convention, and I was stuck for a story, and I got a brilliant idea, which was to go to somebody who might have been at an original Democratic National Convention many, many, many years ago, and I began to think who that might be, and I decided that person should be Arthur Schlesinger. <laughs> then the question was, where was he? Do you remember? He was in the pool of the Royal Daniele Hotel. <laughs> and I found you. He came out of the pool, dried off, and wrote me a wonderful 6,000 word story. So my rushing over here on deadline is nothing compared to that. <laughs> As a, um, a child growing up in New York City, my first knowledge of the United Nations, and some of you in this room may be old enough and may have been in New York at that time to remember this. My first understanding of the United Nations was from New York Daily News photo attack journalism. They would send cameramen out to take pictures of UN diplomats' cars <laughs> illegally parked, and they take it from a panoramic angle. Uh, so we would get the diplomatic plate on the bottom of the frame, and the top of the frame you'd get the bus stop sign or the fire hydrant next to which it was parked, and then right underneath they'd run a caption which would identify that particular UN mission and how many thousands of dollars they owed the city of New York. So I grew up without much high regard for the United Nations. Uh, then two heroes of my youth, Henry Cabot Lodge and uh, Adlai Stevenson, became U.S. permanent representatives. You know in U.N. talk what permanent representative means. Those are those transient diplomats that come through and temporarily represent their countries before moving on. Pat Moynihan used to say, because he went in and out pretty fast, he'd say, I was permanent representative for eight months. Um, <laughs> But when they took over, I suddenly paid attention and realized it was not just a building full of scoflaws. Things really happened over there. Um, attitudes about the United Nations have risen and fallen often since then. And the low estimation seems to be getting the attention now. Uh, even though polls show that 70% of Americans want the United Nations, for instance, to be in Iraq, have a generally favorable view of the United Nations, even if the Bush administration does not. And the president himself is continually warning that the United Nations is in danger of becoming irrelevant, of becoming another um, League of Nations. Now, as the New York Times' new envoy, new permanent representative <laughs> to the United Nations, um, I'm in the process of trying to find out an awful lot about this place in a short time at a fevered moment in its history and how very lucky I am that these two people have written books, both of which I've read, uh, and which are fabulous education. Um, I was pondering how we would do this tonight, and actually I think it will work out quite well as sort of a bookend arrangement. Stephen has written a lyrical account of the San Francisco Charter Convention in 1945 that basically created the United Nations, all the dreams of that time. And Linda has written a book about what the United Nations is today, and we can kind of make a measurement, I think, as to what they intended back then, what they came up with here, and some of the things which they didn't intend, which actually do end up being some of the strengths of the United Nations. So I actually wrote down here a first question, and I wrote the first question here. The first question, the Bush administration is critical of the UN. This is a question for both of you. Um, all says it's irrelevant as the League of Nations. Uh, but Stephen, uh, it began as an American idea, didn't it? And Linda, with the Cold War now over, the US generally gets its way and sort of dominates the UN, doesn't it? So Stephen, tell us first of all, if you will, uh, about the role the United States played and some of the greatest diplomats in our contemporary history uh, and the role they played in that. 
Well, uh, Warren, I could go on for at least two hours in, in answering that question. I'll try to <clears throat> be concise. Um, this organization is really the outgrowth of one of the, uh, of the vision of one of our great presidents, Franklin Roosevelt. It would not have happened without his enormous uh, involvement in, in pushing the project forward. Um, he had learned about the pitfalls of the League of Nations as the Assistant Secretary of Navy during Woodrow Wilson's uh, administration. And he understood that in order to make it a viable project for uh, this country, certain conditions had to be met. I, I can go into them later. But the point was that he, he, he realized that the only way it was going to happen, particularly after one of the greatest calamities that the, that the world had ever endured, which was the Second World War, 70 million people had died in it, that it was only the United States that had the strength and wherewithal to organize it. The U.S. invested $25 million in, in putting together the San Francisco Conference. So many countries were destroyed during the war that it was American military planes that had to airlift delegations into San Francisco. Um, Roosevelt had asked the State Department as early as 1939 to begin the work on a UN charter. I mean, he, even at the beginning time, before the war even began, he was thinking in these very large terms about how we could improve the security of this country in the future. And he understood, because of what had happened during the Wilson period, that the American security was, was only going to be increased by becoming part of a larger international organization. So he instructed the State Department to start working on this charter. And by the 1945, they actually had put together a draft that was uh, taken to San Francisco, and it was on, based on that American draft that the charter came into being. There are a lot of stories about the great American talent out there at that time. I mean, the legal advisor to the U.S. delegation to San Francisco was none other than John Foster Dulles. Uh, the public figure, the, the kind of press officer for the U.S. <clears throat> mission in San Francisco was Adlai Stevenson. John Kennedy covered the San Francisco proceedings as a journalist, as a reporter for the Hearst Papers. Um, Harold Stassen was on the U.S. delegation. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller was the Assistant Secretary of, for Latin American Affairs and played a crucial role in formulating one of the articles of, of the Charter while he was out there. So it was a remarkable group of, of talented individuals, maybe as talented as what created our own American Constitution. Uh, and it was out of that group that produced this document that has survived for 58 years without major changes. So I think what we have to understand today is that, and what our country does not understand, is that this is truly a document made in America, and yet we've disowned it. And we can go into the reasons why we disowned it, but there, there is no question that the stamp of the, the U.S. is all over that document, and that we, as a country, really should be proud of it rather than uh, you know, distancing, distancing our, ourselves from it because of its impact on the world today. Is the stamp of the U.S. all over the U.N. right now, and should we be proud of it? Well, I think that one of the prevailing myths about the U.N. is that um, it's that the Washington administration thinks, number one, that it's um, irrelevant and that the U.S. has disowned it. And it's very interesting because I think on certain levels, if you focus, the thing about the UN is the UN, there are many UNs. It's the, it's the UN of maybe 30 or 40 different organizations and programs and agencies. And while the United States might disown some parts of the family, maybe there are some sons and daughters it doesn't like, it has problems and issues with, it doesn't get its way. But there are other parts of the UN, for example, like the World Food Program, the U UNICEF, UNESCO, the United States just re-entered UNESCO, the UN Educational uh, Scientific and Cultural Organization, after 18 years. So clearly, uh, despite the current administration, I don't want to sound like an apologist, but I think it's, it's important to focus that the, U the U.S. is still very engaged in parts of the U.N. where it feels it's very important and furthers U.S. national interests. And so that, and so, um, anyway, th that's one point I wanted to make. That we may have issues regarding Iraq, we know that, with the Security Council. Um, and I do think, in fact, in my book, you I think you may have alluded to one of my um, experts, quote unquote, in the book, 
talks about how the U.S. does get its way when, but there are caveats, when the U.S. knows exactly what it wants and the entire government is on the same page. I think part of the problem we've had, for example, in the Security Council over the past year, specifically last March, was that there was, in essence, a little war going on in Washington between the Pentagon and the State Department. And so when it came to fighting for what the U.S. wanted at the U.N., we were, in essence, fighting among ourselves, and the picture wasn't clear. We didn't sort of lead um, a very clear-cut you know, battle cry. But I, but I think so. I think that when the U.S. knows what it wants and works with, it, with allies, it doesn't necessarily have to be the same group of allies, but when confers with, it al with its allies and c sort of in, in, is inclusive, it can generally get its way. You know, in reading the two books, I was struck by the fact that a, sort of a conceptual problem, I think, the United States has always had with the United Nations or with a world body, starting with Wilson in 1918, the League of Nations, and continuing right up until the Bush administration now, is this constant conflict on our minds between our sort of continental isolation, our continental independence, and our interdependence with the rest of the world. And isn't that at the sort of heart of why we keep having these ambivalent feelings about the United Nations? You know, it's very interesting. Why did the United Nations, why was it placed in New York City in the first place? As a matter of fact, it wasn't because of American parochialism that had to be here. It was because most of the other countries of the world wanted it to be in New York because they wanted the Americans engaged. They were afraid that if you put it in Europe or some other place, the Americans would wave, wave goodbye and, and show very little interest in it at all. And, 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 and Roosevelt and Truman understood that too. They, 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 need, they realized that in order to break through this kind of uh, incipient American isolationism. There had to be, uh, the, the organization had to be in this country to force the Congress to, to, to engage with it. Um, but I do think that there has always been this uh, tension between uh, uh, kind of uh, lone nationalism and, and internationalism. And it's a tension that can swing in, in different ways during different periods of American history. In the 1920s, obviously, after the defeat of the League, it went in the direction of uh, Fortress America. Uh, and in the 1930s, that continued. It wasn't really until the Second World War that we got re-engaged and, and uh, f kind of accepted the idea that our international, that, that our security was, was better protected by being involved with a greater international organization than it would be to have carried the burden of our our security alone. But I, I just want to mention one thing that Harry Truman, when he addressed the final session of the San Francisco Conference in 1945, made a very important point. He understood from the very beginning that this tension existed. But here's what he said, and I think it relates to your question. This is the final day of the conference. Truman flew out and addressed the, the assembly. He said, we all have to recognize, no matter how great our strength, that we must deny ourselves the license to do always as we please. This is the price which each nation will have to pay for world peace. Unless we pay that price, no organization for world peace can accomplish its purpose. And what a reasonable price that is. He understood that we were going to have to sacrifice some of our sovereignty in order to make this organization work. But that sacrifice of sovereignty comes back to bite us from, from time to time when the more nationalist elements in this country say, how dare the UN tell us what to do? And I think that tension ex obviously exists very much today. Can I just, while we're in that period, there were some wonderful surprises in Stephen's book, but the one that really caught me by surprise, and I wonder if I'm the only person in this room, who always thought the United Nations was a post-war phenomenon. Um, I discovered in reading Stephen's book uh, that the Charter Convention in San Francisco began while the war was still going on, on both fronts, in Europe and in Japan. That was deliberate on Roosevelt's part, wasn't it, Stephen? Yes. I mean, I was mentioning there were four or five conditions that Roosevelt laid down about the UN, but one of them was to have the conference happen while the war was going on. And it was a very keen insight on his part, because he understood that as long as the war was going on, the nations of the globe would focus on creating this international organization. But the day the war ended, 
they would all drift back to their own countries, concerned about reconstructing their societies and reviving their economies, and they would go, give short shrift to an a international uh, organ like, like the UN. So he, he very deliberately wanted to start it while the war was still ensuing. And I think, actually, he was absolutely right about that. Even as the, in fact, midway through the San Francisco Congress, the <coughs> European war did end. And as a result, most of the foreign ministers from Europe all went back to Europe instead of continuing at the conference because they wanted to deal with the, their homelands. So he, he, under, he did see that as a principal condition for, for mounting this conference during, during the war. I'm going to keep jumping back time to time here. I hope you can stay with me. Linda, one of the reasons that the United Nations is open to ridicule sometimes is some of the incongruous things that happen. For instance, there is something, I think it's one of the six main pillars of the organization, is something called the Trusteeship Council, <coughs> whose responsibility is decolonization. There are no more colonies left. Why is the Trusteeship <laughs> Council left? And the other one I had in mind, oh, wait a second, it's uh, the other obvious one like that. If I can't think of it, I'll, I'll skip it. And uh, there's, uh, there's another irrelevancy. Anyway. Um, the Military Commission, that's the other well, one. Well, but that was, I have, a, I'll, I'll have get back to it in a second. But my point <laughs> is, um, uh, uh, there, are, there are these funny kind of holdover parts of the United Nations that really have no purpose and no use. Um, uh, wh why has the organization not been able to reform, refine, modernize itself enough so that people can't take those sort of shots at it? I think the, the quick answer to that question is that it begins and ends with revising the UN Charter. I just remembered, there is a non-aligned movement. Oh, yes. What does that mean in 2004? <laughs> Excuse me. Exactly. Right. And that, of course, the non-aligned movement of, you know what that was, the you know, group of mostly developing countries who were non-aligned or, you know, in favor of the Soviet Union, ostensibly, <coughs> or the United States. But at the UN, very often, this group is very much alive these days. And of course, many American diplomats like to say the only people they're not aligned against is the United States. <laughs> but um, I think getting back to your question about the Trusteeship Council, the Trusteeship Council, of course, is one of the six uh, main organs of the UN created, uh, you know, under the original charter, and was very successful in helping to oversee, you know, the transition of various uh, dependent colonies into statehood. And it basically went out of business a few years ago when the last trustee became independent. But the question is, you know, it, it raises the larger question is, how do you deal with reforming the UN? How do you get an institution that was founded in 1945, about to be 60, 2005, next year, is that next year? My goodness. And um, the problem is you then have to open up that charter, and it's a can of worms. And the issue is you can't you know, get rid of the Trusteeship Council unless you change the charter. And of course, that begs the question of what about the Security Council? We know that that's now you know, the principal organ. Uh, in many American diplomats' viewpoints, in most Americans' viewpoints, it's probably viewed as the most important UN body charged with maintaining international peace and security. It's the organ, of course, that the United States, Britain, France, Russia, and China have veto power in and deals with the major crises. But again, you, how can you reform and or, uh, even the Security Council unless the member states agree? And you know, there's a big debate going on at the UN over the past decade. And a lot of the work gets done in this committee, this General Assembly Committee called the Open-Ended Working Group on Strengthening the, the UN Security Council and equitable, equitable Representation on the Security Council. It's quite a mouthful. But I, but I saw that there are a few journalists here in the audience who have covered the UN over the years. And I think a number of them will agree with me that you know, we all sort of laugh at it and sort of the, the the, the, the pet name for it is, it's the never-ending, open-ended working <laughs> group on revising the Security Council and changing it. And, and to make light of it, I mean, that really is the problem. To change the charter requires that the five permanent members of the Security Council agree. And when it comes to the Security Council, for example, can we see in our lifetimes France or even Great Britain giving up their permanent seat and their veto on the Security Council? 
So I think that you know this is this is part of the problem with, with you know with the UN is that it's you could make some some changes, some administrative reforms with Boutros, which Boutros Ghali I think really did help streamline the organization, cut the staff, did some made some administrative changes, and of course Kofi Annan has uh, taken it much much further. But the issue is how do you reform the structure unless the big powers agree? Can I just stay with the idea of Security Council reform? It is so essential, the Security Council, and we'll get to this later, being absolutely the most important part of the UN. The five nations that have the vote right now, that have the veto right now reflect accurately the world of 1945, but have nothing to do with the world of 2004. If you were going to have the Security Council uh, a logical reflection of the world now, um, you would have India, Japan, maybe Germany, um, an African nation like Nigeria or South Africa, or an African league or regional group uh, on it. I'm probably leaving out one or two. I mean, clearly, um, that's the way reform has to go. And yet, everyone I've talked to in the three weeks that I've been working at the United <laughs> Nations have said, dream on. I had lunch um, with the French ambassador, uh, um, elegant as all French ambassadors are, named Jean-Marc de la Sablière. And at one point, I said to him, uh, we were talking about Security Council reform, and he agreed with everything I was saying about the complete um, illogic of having these five nations in this sort of dated status there. But when I said to him at one point, well, would France ever give up the veto? I got one of the most extraordinary, um, um, uh, voluptuous uh, uh, expressions of the Gallic shrug of disdain <laughs> and, and uh, dismissal you've ever seen. It was not, and there weren't, it wasn't even a word. It was just, oh, you know, imagine. Uh, so now I haven't asked um, Amor Jones Parry, the British ambassador, but I lived in Britain for seven years, and they would be just as reluctant also. These are small countries that have, frankly, disproportionate power at the United Nations, and they're not about to give it up. And if you then go the next step, as I did with him, and said, well, maybe the way to get Germany in there is to have one EU seat. And he said, well, you first of all have to have one EU foreign policy, which, of course, you will never have, before you have one EU seat. Um, Richard Holbrook, somebody who is probably a friend of many of ours here, uh, quoted um, frequently in we all quote Richard Holbrook. He's one of the most quotable people in the world, and <laughs> Linda quotes him a lot. I had lunch with him last week, and he simply said, it will never happen. Security Council reform, which I think you can say is essential to the future of the United Nations, is simply never going to happen. So where does that leave us? Well, I, I don't think it never will happen. It just may not happen the way people, many of the smaller states, want it to happen. There is a likelihood that they may expect expand the membership of the Security Council from 15 to 20 or 21. The question is whether those additional five or six states are going to be rotating states with, not, with no veto, or will they be permanent members with, with, with veto or permanent members without the veto? Those are issues that would have to be dealt with. But I think they could have expansion of the Security Council without a, a major upheaval in, in the UN. The problem comes down to, as you were saying, uh, is the five states that have the veto. Under the UN Charter, if you were to have another San Francisco conference and come up with all the great reforms that everybody wants, any one of those five states that have the veto could, could veto any of those changes. So you cannot have a San Francisco conference again without having the agreement of those five countries. And it is true that these five states are kind of frozen in amber from 1945. Uh, it is odd, though, that in 1945, the Soviet Union, Great Britain, and the United States were the most powerful countries in the world. But China, France, France was destroyed by the war, and China was uh, in, in involved in a civil war. They were actually pulled in by, by the combination of Churchill pulling in France and Roosevelt pulling in China. Um, in any event, uh, the other question that one deals with when you're trying to get further permanent members with veto powers is, if you do, for example, decide that Latin America needs representation, and you say, well, Brazil's the biggest country in, the, in, the, in, in Latin America, then Argentina objects. 
Or if you put in, you suggest India, then Pakistan objects. And if you select Germany, then Italy sub objects. So you can never get a, that kind of resolution without having starting ge you know, regional conflicts that you, that you probably don't want. There was a part of Stephen's book when I read and I thought to myself, Colin Powell would read this wistfully. It <laughs> described a moment when France, in a fit of pique, almost walked away and threw away its Security Council veto. Tell me about that. Well, it was, uh, the France had just, was re just, had just been liberated, was re starting to recover in the early 1945 period. And de Gaulle, who had assumed the titular leadership of, of the country, was frightfully upset because he had not been invited to Yalta in February of 1945 by Roosevelt or Churchill or Stalin. And so as a way of, of showing his disgust with the whole matter, he had, he had been invited by those three countries to be one of the five veto-bearing states to sponsor the UN conference. He refused to be involved in any sponsorship and said that unless these countries, these three countries, and China was a kind of <coughs> add-on, accepted certain amendments that France wanted right then, he would refuse to be part of the five uh, veto-bearing states. Well, they refused to accept his veto, so he so France came into the San Francisco conference as just one of the of many states without any special powers. And then about three weeks into the conference, and what, what France did was it decided to become the champion of the smaller states. And it tried to organize them as a kind of counterweight to the, uh, to, to the big countries, Soviet Union, Great Britain, and, and, and uh, the United States. But all the big decisions were, being ta were taking place in the penthouse that Secretary of State Satinius was occupying. And all the big issues were decided there. And France suddenly woke up about three weeks later and said, hey, we want to be part of that. And they, they, one day, uh, the uh, French Foreign Minister Bidal came to um, Satinius and said, you know, we don't want to help the smaller states anymore. We decided to forget them. We want to." We, 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 if you don't let us come back and become a veto-bearing power, right now, we're going to go back to France and forget this whole thing. So Satinius said, fine, you know, we've always wanted you to join us. Please join. And that was the end of that flirtation with, with, um, with the smaller states. The, the United Nations that Stephen Schlesinger writes about had 49 countries. Is that right? By the end of it, it was 50. Uh, the one that Linda is writing about has 191, is that correct? Exactly. Those, um, most of those states get their shot in the General Assembly. Um, that's the only reason the General Assembly exists, right? I mean, it's pretty much a useless body, isn't it? You sound like you're quoting Richard Holbrook. This is, this is meant to be a provocative <laughs> question. I mean, it's clear that the United States over the years has had issues with the 100, now 191 member General Assembly. And of course, you, know, you may know that this is a main body. It's always prided itself on having universal membership, which means that every country, country from China to Benin gets one vote. But the catch is that the votes and the resolutions are really only recommendations, and they are not binding and that the only resolutions in the UN system that are legally binding, you know, in terms of the main bodies, are those of the Security Council. So on that level, it's, it's a very different, you know, kind of, uh, of uh, legal structure. But it's true, the, the, a lot of, a lot, the Americans and, and a lot of the West um, finds they've have had problems over the years in the General Assembly. In the 70s, um, when Moynihan was there and John Scali and, the, the General Assembly at that point maybe had 150 or so members, but it was going through a period where it was dominated by small, more radical elements within the developing world. And um, the Americans sort of thought of the General Assembly as being, you know, there being a tyranny of the majority. And I think that that attitude, you know, has pretty much kept to the present time in that it's not easy to do serious business from the point of view of the United States in the General Assembly, number one, because, then the, the, because the, the numbers are basically structured against the United States. And also, I have to say, a lot of countries um, misuse, I think, 
the General Assembly for their own political gains. And very, very often it just becomes a forum for, you know, taking pot shots against one nation or another. Um, there, there have been key... We, we know which nation you're talking about. I wonder who could that be. <laughs> I mean, one of the areas that, uh, one, one issue that has dominated the General Assembly has probably been, you know, one of the, you know, the most uh, prolific um, issues there has been, of course, the Arab-Israeli conflict and and, of course, the United States is not very happy about having the General Assembly deal with this issue because it's sort of structured against, you know, U.S. policy. And uh, there's an automatic majority in favor of, of uh, the Palestinians. And so the, United, you know, so, so the General Assembly really is a difficult body at this place, you know, at, at this point in time. One good thing that does come out of the General Assembly, I think, from a U.S. point of view, is that it is an important place for negotiating, coming up with treaties and, um, you know, getting countries to, to create and sign on to, eventually sign on to uh, treaties that are very useful and, and help, you know, so that it can help promote the rule of law. But I think in terms of actually solving crises, you know, it, it hasn't uh, had a good rep in the past few years. Linda, you've covered the United Nations for how many years? I like to say sometimes, and I, it's hard to say this, and I'm, and I'm saying it with a caveat, but I'd like to say that I owe my career in journalism a little bit to Saddam Hussein. <laughs> this is a better question because, than I thought. <laughs> because ironically, you know, the world loves a dictator. The, you, the media as we know it loves, loves a, you know, a ruthless di uh, authoritarian type who is, is horrible. But I'd like to say that one thing about Saddam Hussein is that you can count on him for news. And he has definitely helped revive the news business at the UN. Um, I know that it was, I, I sort of came on board in 1990. I started covering the UN. I tried to persuade him on the local public radio station, WNYC, in here, in, here in town, that the UN was a local beat. And this would be, you know, a great place for stories. It ref it's another sort of slice of life of New York. And, 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 and interestingly enough, you know, we got, we got some support for that. You know, it, one thing that comes out of my book, and I think I'm sure in Stephen's book, is how important people are and that people matter. And whoever's at the helm of an organization can make the big difference. And at that point at WNYC, there was a leadership that sort of, you know, bought into this idea. And so I started covering the UN, but found it was very, very difficult to get anything on the air. I mean, it was sort of, you know, oh, that bureaucracy, what's really going on there. And um, it was just remarkable how things sort of just changed overnight when Saddam invaded Kuwait on August 2nd, 1990. And of course, President Bush won, decided that the UN Security Council, because of course this was the a new world, this was the, the Cold War had ended, and so he really thought that the Security Council was a good place to mobilize an international coalition to reverse the occupation. And so basically starting from that moment forward, it was, you know, more or less e easy to uh, get, you know, news interest in the UN. So I'm afraid what's going to happen now that he's, you know, buried somewhere <laughs> in a cell, you we'll know. Find, we'll we, find new things. Okay. We'll find new things. Anyway, um, uh, You've worked there for 13 years. You worked there for several years, didn't you? Two actually, years, yeah. Mm -hmm. My question was, is it possible to say um, what kind of people work there? I mean, I think there is a suspicion from outside that it's just a building full of bureaucrats and suits. Um, I think I've heard from other people that actually there are numbers of extremely dedicated international civil servants there. Um, which one is true? Well, in my, in my brief experience, you, Linda may have a much better sense of this, but I, I was quite amazed. I'd come from working for New York State as uh, an assistant to Governor Mario Cuomo. And, you know, there are a lot of time servers in the state government and people who are not particularly idealistic but, but like the salaries. And I have to tell you, when I went to the UN, I found a lot of idealism in the, in the young people and, and people who had actually been there for many years. Now, it, it is true that um, countries t have a tendency to dump some of their uh, near, near to wells on jobs in, in international organizations. I didn't see very much sign of that. I, I really saw a lot of dedicated people who were willing to make this their mission in life. 
And I was very impressed by it. I was, it was a great contrast to, to what I'd seen in the New York State bureaucracy. So I think the UN does appeal to pe people's better instincts, and it does attract a very lot of, a lot of very talented people. Now, obviously, there are weaknesses in the organization, and um, I, my, I was I was lucky enough to work for Habitat, which was very small and very well well run division dealing with global cities. I did not have many encounters with the other divisions, and maybe you can address that. You know, it's very interesting. I always like to say when people sort of, sometimes, I'll, you know, I'll be speaking somewhere and people will get on this track about, you know, the inefficient bureaucracy and these, you know, these dead, dead beats, dead weights at the UN and, and people have jobs for life and nobody's really that, that interested. And then I always say, for me, the litmus test is this. I know at least when I call up the United Nations, I get a real, you know, a real voice. <laughs> you know, for, so I, th I think we have to keep it in perspective in terms of there's, there's always a bureaucratic element, whether it's you know, New York State government, New York City, Washington, the federal government, try calling the IRS. I mean, you know, we, you know, I think it's part of it is the nature of the beast and you have to accommodate that. That being said, having been part of the UN and watched the UN and gone out, you know, obviously part of the job of a journalist is to develop sources. And I have to say that over the past 13 years, I've seen a, you know, a sea change in terms of the numbers of very competent, as you say, idealistic and very professional people who are now in positions of authority and who are willing to talk to the press. When I first went there in 1990, I, even, I found that there still was this mindset of, you know, of, of lack of transparency, you know, we don't, the press is the enemy, you don't want to be open, you don't want to talk about what you do. It was very difficult to get, you know, get a fix on what's really going on in different agencies and programs and funds. Um, I think, again, part of the reform, and I do think, I'm one of the people that think that some of the pressures put by the U.S. government and the, and the allies who do foot most of the bill, you know, the United States now ha ha pays 22% of the regular budget. Japan is up there paying 20%. Germany pays 12 And then you have, you know, many of the um, European nations like Great Britain, France, Italy paying 5 or 6%. So, you know, when you really look at the Western powers, um, you know, they pay the lion's share. But so I do think the pressure to reform the UN has helped it. And I think part of that has been in, in getting rid of a lot of the dead weight. I mean, some people now, there's the opposite sense of the UN that you can't get a permanent job, that it's very hard to, you know, you'll get three-month contracts, six-month contracts, but it's hard to sort of get these jobs that people, you know, the American public still think exist, you know, get a job at the UN and you're there for life. Um, so I think that they've, you know, they've uh, made that a lot more difficult. And I do think that part of it does go to the people at the top. And I think, for example, in the last seven years that Kofi Annan has been Secretary General, he's made a real concerted effort. And I think he's also motivated and attracted by want of his personality, you know, by the moral authority that he, he has and by his, his view, you know, his, his presence and his, his views, his vision. I think a lot at the UN is now attracting perhaps many more people than in the past, you know, it was a place to send your brother-in-law out of the country if, you know, you <laughs> wanted to have him li li live in New York and, you know, have a cozy life, not do so much. I remember there are times where I would, I used to call these people wanderers. Like in the first few years I was at the UN, I would like always see these people walking around the UN, you know, any time of day. And you know journalists, we have weird hours. Those colored cards though. <laughs> yes. We're green. They're red. Yes, right. We we green green cards, <coughs> green passes are the journalists. Red are the um, the UN uh, the staff um, that write the and and the delegates are another. So. But the point is, there are always a lot of people who seem to have a lot of time on their hands. <laughs> you know, if you decided at, well, you know, Warren, right? If you want to interview someone, one thing at the UN, you're always having coffee, cappuccino, <laughs> wine, lunch, dinners, drinks, you know, this kind of thing. You know, if you, don't, if you decide, if you can't eat or, you know, have that kind of lifestyle, you're in big trouble. Because diplomat, there, that's, that's the, you know, that's the M.O. But I would notice that there are a lot of people, no matter what time of day, I would go to try to, you know, take someone to the diplomatic lounge. And these people were, like, always there. And I think that part of the problem, <laughs> you know, like, what are you doing? And you know, occasionally I would try to introduce myself. 
And the reality was they really didn't have much to do. And I think that sort of brings it full circle to the back to also that many of the diplomats, there are 191 countries and loads of diplomats, the permanent representatives and various staff members, but you know, many of them really don't have that much to do unless you're on the Security Council these days. Or, or very active as chair, you know, chair, chairpersons of various important committees, because the Security Council now meets like daily. But you know, if you're just on the General Assembly, you know, three year, three months a year, and then you pay attention to some other issues. So I mean, but, but that being said, I do think that the caliber of the representation, you know, it, it's just night and day just in the past 12 years. While we're on the subject of food, a subject that does <laughs> interest. UN delegates a lot. <laughs> uh, I have one impression and one question. My impression is, um, I had no idea some of these restaurants still existed. <laughs> I, was, I was taken to Lutece last week. <laughs> Supported um, in large part by the And there have been a few other ones that have never seen a sun-dried tomato or a free-range chicken. I mean, these are really old-fashioned places. The question is, why do UN ambassadors always want you to meet them for lunch at 1.15? <laughs> I can't answer that one. Stop. Because the meetings go, tend to go till 1 o'clock, if they stay. Uh, actually, they, they set it for 1.15 and then they show up at 1.30, is in my experience. Um, uh, any of you who are interested in um, parlor games, trivial pursuit, that sort of thing, Pay attention. Stephen, who was the first acting Secretary General of the United Nations who actually hand carried the UN Charter to Harry Truman in Washington? Alger Hiss. <laughs> he was. And what uh, was he doing in San Francisco? <laughs> I have a whole chapter on uh, those kind of machinations. I think he actually was doing the administrative work of the U.S. mission out there. He was not involved in the policy side, so far as I can ascertain. He, um, he had been brought in by uh, Secretary Stettinius, having just come from the Yalta conference. As you remember, Alger Hiss was also at Yalta with FDR. Um, he, um, is, he was known at that time by a number of people to be a, a former communist. And I actually have quotes from Henry Grunwald, who was then a young staffer at Time Magazine, who was told by Whitaker Chambers, who was then an editor at Time Magazine, and they were looking at some AP dispatch from San Francisco about Alger Hiss, and Whitaker Chambers turned to Henry Grunwald and said, you know, that man's a communist. And uh, Grunwald thought it was very bizarre comment and didn't really think very much about it and kind of went on, did something else and, and didn't really remember it until years later when all this stuff came out about his. I actually did some investigative work on using the vo vo famous Venona docu files that came out from the FBI. And there are some references to somebody named Al's, A-L-E-S, which some people surmise was Alger Hiss, but I don't think there's any real proof that it was Alger Hiss. And so far as I can see, if he was a spy, he was not doing any spying in San Francisco. Um, in any case, he was assigned the task of being the acting secretary general of the UN conference. And his contemporaries all felt he did a very good job. And he was then told, uh, asked by Secretary of State Stinius to take a military plane uh, with uh, accompanied by army officers to take the UN charter, which had been signed by all the uh, delegates at the c conference, back to Washington to present to, to President Truman. And when, when they boarded the plane, the, the uh, UN charter was wrapped in a case and a parachute was put on it, but none of the other people in the plane had parachutes. <laughs> <laughs> so that if if the plane went down, at least they could get the charter out the window and save that. And um, then when Hiss arrived uh, to go to the White House to meet with Truman, he, you know, anticipated a formal ceremony and that there would be a kind of transfer of the document from his hands to the president's hands. And Truman greeted him in shirt sleeves with a bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> 
and hanging around with some of his pals and said, you know, bring in the charter and shook his hand and his left very dis disappointed there hadn't been a formal, formal ceremony. Another part of Stephen's book, which by the way, uh, one of its great merits is it, it, it treats a period which historians have really kind of ignored. And one of the, uh, the episodes that has some surprising participants and a conclusion that I would like to uh, ask you about is an episode involving um, a fight that almost brought the entire negotiation down. And it involved Argentina and Poland. And then the thing I wanted to ask you, Stephen, is I read that story about, and if you would just tell us briefly how that came to pass, I read that and thought to myself, you know, this probably was the first Cold War struggle, though nobody at that time realized it. And it was a Cold War struggle, since the Russians were on one side and the Americans on the other, that probably presaged the thing that would paralyze the United Nations for the next two or three decades. Well, that was actually an interesting discovery I made about the San Francisco Conference. Most of the disputes were between the United States and the Soviet Union. And it, it started from the very beginning when, there was, when the Molotov, who had been in a kind of foul mood the moment he arrived in San Francisco, uh, demanded that the president of the conference should be ro rotate between the four sponsors of the conference. Well, traditionally, when you host an international conference, the conference that's the host is supposed to be the president of the conference. So this became a big fight that was eventually settled with a sort of modest compromise where the U.S. was the titular head and Soviet Union, Great Britain, and, and um, China were uh, sort of the minor heads of the, of the conference. But the, the issue that you raised is, is a little complicated, but basically this is what happened. Uh, Latin Americans had formed a block when they came to San Francisco. And they were insisting that if they were going to participate in this conference, they wanted Argentina to be admitted. The reason why Argentina was being opposed by so many countries is it was a crypto-Nazi country. It had basically sympathized with the Nazis during the Second World War. So most of these countries were saying, why should we let this, this, this kind of uh, pernicious state into, into a global group of, of, sta of, of countries trying to create a peace, peaceful organization. Um, the Soviet Union led the charge against Argentina. On the other hand, the Soviet Union had its own interests. It wanted two additional votes in, 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 beside its own. Uh, it wanted two countries that it dominated, Belarus and Ukraine, to be admitted as separate states, though they were basically occupied by the Soviet Union. And that was part of the agreement of Yalta that uh, Roosevelt accepted. On the other hand, there was one other state that the Soviet Union wanted in, which was Poland, which the US and Great Britain absolutely resisted its admission. Why? Because Poland was, run, it was a puppet communist government run out of Lublin in, in, in Poland. And the, the deal in, 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 in Yalta was that Poland should not be admitted to, to the UN until it had a democratic government. That is, it allowed the exiled Poles in London and the underground Poles in Poland to participate in a, de de in a coalition regime in Poland, which the Soviets opposed. So all these issues were kind of floating around, and they all came to a head in the second week in the conference. Uh, Arch as I said, Latin America was threatening to leave if Argentina could get admitted. The Russians wouldn't have come in unless the two votes, Ukraine and Belarus, were uh, part of the package when, they, uh, when the conference began. So the Latin said, and, and Poland I'm putting aside for the moment, Latin said, we'll accept po Belarus and Ukraine in exchange for uh, in supporting the Soviet Union, in exchange for the Soviet Union supporting the admission of Argentina. Satinius thought he'd worked out a deal, but it turned out th that at that point, the Soviet Union demanded that Poland be admitted forthwith because they just simply said, we, weren't, we, we would not agree to the conference unless that happened. Well, in the end, they, the deal actually was worked out where Argentina was admitted, Belarus and Ukraine was all, were also admitted, so that exchange happened, and Poland was pushed aside, and at that point, Satinius was very fearful that the Soviets would, would walk out of the conference. But Molotov, realizing that he could not win on Poland, there was just too much opposition in, in, in San Francisco, finally said, okay, we'll, we'll deal with Poland. 
much later. So that, that was how the, th that, that worked out. But there was no question that the Soviets were willing to have a showdown with the U.S. over uh, those issues. And that did show that there was a great deal of tension from the very beginning between Washington and Moscow about all the different uh, factors that, that played into San Francisco. Because as you know, they, they later fought over the issue of the veto. They, they fought over the issue of how much power the General Assembly should have, and a number of other questions. And all of these issues presides, as you said, the Cold War, because it became clear that the distrust between Stalin and Roosevelt and later Truman was such that it was almost inevitable there was going to be a break. Did, did you mention the name of the rabble rouser who turned the Latins into an obstreperous and powerful group at that conference? Yes, Nelson Rockefeller. <laughs> um, um, I've got a few more questions, and I honestly don't know how this drill works since I'm sort of a late addition here. But if any of you have questions for our authors, please raise your hand, and I will yield instantly to you. Um, but in the meantime, while you don't, I thought I would sort of finish this off by looking to the future. Um, Stephen Schlesinger points out in his book that one of the reasons the Charter worked and carried and the UN became something that existed as opposed to what happened to the League of Nations was that a mighty public relations campaign was, was put into motion. Um, is that what the UN needs today, Linda, to gain acceptance? Well, I think that if, um, I think if the UN Foundation certainly thinks so, uh, which of course is the Turner Group that um, has been created to help uh, promote and also uh, subsidize some of the work of the UN. I mean, I do think that, you know, being a journalist these years at the UN, that it's very difficult to convey what the UN is because it's so multifaceted, because it's, you know, because it has so, there are myriad faces. And I do think that um, over the years, the UN itself has not projected itself in a positive way, or at least in the United States, where we can relate. And so, I, I mean, I think probably um, that, you know, it's not a bad idea. And I do think that the UN itself, the Department of Information, um, under Shashi Theroux at this point, is very much looking outward and trying to, you know, get the word and out about the UN. And so I, I do think that that's uh, something that it has not done well. I can, I can tell you something as, as a new correspondent there that I've discovered, and I've heard from all my mates in the press corps that it's true. It's an enormous fount of information and people that are really informed. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit like the experience I had as a young reporter in Washington encountering some of the really good Senate staffs, in my particular case, Senator Jacob Javits, who just had the most wonderful group of young people working for him. But the United Nations, it does have that asset, you know, and of course it's our job to get that information out. Do you have any thoughts though about that? Is, uh, is that what it needs or does it need something else? Well, I, you know, I, I believe that there's been an injunction against the UN promoting itself. I don't think it's, I, in fact, no, I think that's true. I think they, they, there's been a very deliberate um, design by which the UN was sort of stop, stopped from, from publicizing its activities because there was a feeling that was kind of interfering with the uh, internal affairs of this country or other countries by doing that. And so um, there has never been any great effort by the UN to promote itself in that sense. And I think that's why this Turner Organization and the UN Association of the USA and some of these other groups have been absolutely vital in, in getting the word out. But frankly, I think part of the problem has been Washington, our own series of presidents in recent decades have not really paid much attention to the UN and certainly have not educated the citizens of this country about the importance of, of the UN to our own national security objectives. And I think that's been one of the great failures uh, w why the UN has not been supported in this country. I mean, we all point out the, the so-called unilateralism of the Bush administration. Clinton went into Bosnia and then into Kosovo in both cases without UN authorization, right? So that's been a bit of a pattern. Um, I still encourage people to raise hands and ask questions. Please. What's it going to take to get the UN back into Iraq? Um. That's what I was writing about tonight. 
Stay tuned for next week. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. That's, that's, that is the great question right now. You have, um, on the two sides, you have the United States now almost desperately wanting the United Nations back in Iraq um, to gain at least an international imprimatur for this action um, in the thought that somehow the UN will be um, uh, not a target for Iraqi dissidents the way the United States is. That's the UN's interest, and yet I'm not convinced the, U the US is willing to meet the objections of Kofi Annan, which are the following. First, security. Uh, them were UN employees. One of them was Sergio Vieira de Mello, who was the mission head. And in a lot of people's minds, Kofi Annan's successor, maybe? I mean, certainly a gigantic player at the United Nations. Um, Except from the wrong region. Asia, Asia's next, <coughs> not Latin America. And um, that's right, exactly, you can't. But um, uh, the, so security is, is just enormously important to Kofi Annan, and he feels it on a personal basis as a commitment to his people, and he feels it on sort of a principle basis, that, that uh, one of his spokesmen said to me, and I actually put this in the New York Times, the United States is treating us like we're the Foreign Legion, but we're not the Foreign Legion. We're more like the State Department. Uh, and you don't, if, if the State Department gets bombed, you pull State Department people out. You don't send them off, you know, across the crest of the hill on their horses. Um, the second thing that Kofi Annan is asking for, and I think it's a legitimate request and one that hasn't been fully met by the United States, is more clarity about what it is the United Nations will do when it gets there. He said in Geneva at one point, soon after the bombing, he said bad resolutions kill people. And by that he sort of meant a lack of clarity, a vagueness of purpose, can really have fatal consequences for workers at the UN. He feels that keenly. So security guarantees, clarity of mission are the two things that, um, that he is asking for. The United <coughs> States, I can't tell you completely their response because uh, it's a bit vague, and also John Negroponte, the ambassador now, who is not a member of the cabinet, which makes him a little less powerful than his predecessors who were, um, obviously has to take instruction from Washington, and we're not completely clear on what those are. Uh, he met with Kofi Annan on Friday. They talked about a number of things. Uh, we don't know too much about what it was. It obviously was about the question you raised, going back into Iraq. At the moment, Kofi Annan's position is we will not go back in until there is a transfer of power, which is July 1st, under the present plans. The reason I was delayed in getting here tonight is, I don't mean to get too specific here, but you have probably read in recent days a very powerful Shiite, um, Ayatollah Sist al-Sistani, in Iraq has objected to the American plan to have caucuses to produce an interim assembly by June 30th. And this objection is one the Americans must take very seriously because this guy is so powerful. And the Shiites, as you know, are the numerical majority in Iraq. So we think, we reporters think, the United States is now thinking, well, we're going to have to go back and meet some of the U United Nations demands for getting in there because it looks as if we're not going to be able to solve this ourselves without some help from these guys. The story today was that Kieran Prendergast, who is an undersecretary, undersecretary general for political affairs, wrote a letter to John Negroponte, the American ambassador, saying, in two weeks, we are going to send four security specialists to Iraq. <coughs> what that told us was the United Nations is now saying, OK, um, we'll accede to your desire to get us back in there, but we're going to send our own people in first to make sure that you're going to provide the sort of security that we think we need to commit our people back to Iraq, and the Americans have agreed to let that go forward. So I think you've got a bit of a compromise uh, coming out there. And, um, and then the other thing that's happening is on next Monday, the 19th of January, Kofi Annan, three weeks ago, called for a meeting, a three-way meeting, with the Coalition Provisional Authority, the United States, basically run group, 
Jerry Bremer being the head of it. 